Uh, psychology of money. Uh, some psychologists would claim that um, economics is just a branch of psychology because it's all to do with uh, people's emotions and uh, decision-making processes. That's probably a bit of an exaggeration, uh, but the economists certainly accept that there is a field uh, called behavioral economics that uh, they are very happy with and is becoming increasingly important and uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about this evening. Now a very early contributor to the field of behavioral economics was our very own Sir Thomas Gresham uh, who came up with the idea that good money drives out bad. Hello, hello. <laughs> uh, he was required by Queen Elizabeth I to explain why the realm was being depleted of silver. And he said, well, it's like this, mum, your father, Henry VIII, cuts the silver coinage with 40% base metals at one point because he was uh, anxious to fund his um, escapades <laughs> overseas. And uh, the problem was that the, the old... Uh, fully silver coinage remained in circulation in parallel with the debased coinage, with the result that, of course, people held on to the silver coinage and uh, they spent the debased coins or shipped them overseas. So that's where Britain's silver went at that point. So... Uh, that, of course, will happen if uh, people introduce counterfeit money. They will naturally want to spend the counterfeit money they printed and hold on to the good stuff themselves. Now, when the Bank of England counterfeits money, and uh, they call it euphemistically quantitative easing, uh, how do they get away with that? Quite simply because the new money is indistinguishable from the old so that uh, you wouldn't know which is the bad money and which is the good money in order to get rid of the bad. Uh, it does, of course, fuel inflation. And uh, only the economists can tell you whether inflation is a good or bad thing when we are in economic difficulty. Um, I, I am not qualified to comment upon that. Looking at some of the uh, very human instincts that might be operative in uh, financial matters, one is the uh, social contagion effect or the herding instinct, if you like, that people will tend to follow others. They will jump on bandwagons. And it is a very powerful driver of share movements. Everybody's watching what everybody else is doing. Uh, even if they don't know what they're doing themselves. Uh, and uh, you get steep rises and falls uh, for that very reason. A very basic animal instinct transferred to the share market. Investment bubbles are a well-known phenomenon on the stock exchange, uh, the famous ones being the tulip bulbs, uh, the South Sea bubble, and more recently the dot-com bubble. And uh, this is the typical form that they take. That at the beginning, there are one or two clever investors who identify some stocks or companies that they think are promising, and they will begin to slip their money into those companies. As the companies share value begins to grow, uh, eventually they begin to get a little bit of publicity. It gets taken up by institutional investors. And uh, the media will spot that something is going on here, and the shares might get tipped in uh, the columns of, of the Financial Times or, or even the, the tabloid newspapers. Then you get uh, the public climbing in, full of enthusiasm, which moves to greed, uh, and soon delusion uh, until it, at some point uh, there is a tipping point. Uh, very often it's triggered by uh, computerized selling from the major companies. They've reached uh, a criterion where the computer says sell. And then it climbs over the top there 
and uh, your average investor, Joe Public, begins to get frightened and uh, there is a total collapse which is the bear market and um, total capitulation, despair, the shares fall below the normative level until eventually they return to the original underlying trend. And this is why they say it's important if you're buying uh, stocks to, and, and shares to keep your money in there for a considerable period of time because it will be a bumpy ride. And if you are always the person who buys at the top and sells in despair, then you are the big loser. There are a number of ways in which people behave irrationally when it comes to um, decisions with respect to their finances. After they have uh, bought some shares, they tend to look out for evidence that they made the right choice. It's a confirmation bias. People are tuned to information that would justify what they have already done. And uh, within social psychology, that is called an attempt to avoid a very unpleasant, discomforting experience that is called cognitive dissonance. There is an entire theory and set of experiments surrounding the phenomenon of cognitive dissonance. This is a fine example of it um, operating within uh, financial markets. Not only will they look for reassurance that they made the right decision in buying, but if they have sold recently, they look for reassurance that the stock went down to also confirm retrospectively what the decision that they have already made. There's some interesting studies of this phenomenon at the race course in which um, people who have already placed a bet are asked what they think are the chances of that horse winning and they rate it as higher than people who were about to make a similar bet uh, and uh, in a parallel situation. The people who have already made the bet think that the horse has got a better chance of winning than those who are about to place their bet. One of the uh, biases, cognitive biases, operating in the commercial world is uh, the optimistic bias which can generate certain false beliefs. One of them is called the illusion of control, the belief that we have a grip on events, uh, not just the victims of luck. You buy some shares and the shares go up. You don't say to yourself, oh, I was just lucky. You, you say, oh, how clever I was. I knew those, those shares were good. Uh, you've got more of a problem if they've gone down, of course. That, then it becomes bad luck. <laughs> Something didn't go your way. Uh, another false belief is called the planning fallacy, which is, in general terms, people will underestimate the costs of a project and uh, how quickly it is going to be completed, uh, and they will um, overestimate the benefits of that project. Um, perhaps a very famous example being the Sydney Opera House, which... Uh, they agreed that they would build it in 1958 and they expected it to be completed by 1963 and the estimated cost was 7 million Australian dollars. No, American dollars, I think. Uh, they're much the same now. Uh, it was ultimately finished 10 years late and cost 102 million dollars slightly over budget, uh, as you can see. Uh, that's an, perhaps an extreme example, but, uh, but many major works projects tend to follow that pattern. Now, whether it's an, it really is wishful thinking or whether the people who are doing the planning uh, deliberately uh, make these uh, false presumptions in order to persuade the authorities to... Um, to give the go-ahead. I couldn't be 100% sure. There could have been a little bit of that involved as well. 
But if it is optimism, uh, it's generally good, both for individuals who are, of course, more resilient if they have that kind of personality. Uh, they are found to have stronger immune systems and uh, they actually live longer, perhaps partly as a result of that. And optimism might be good for the general public as well because it is um, a driver of capitalistic enterprises which um, otherwise people might get cold feet about fairly early on and abandon. The idea of sunk costs refers to the tendency to throw good money after bad. Uh, we are very reluctant to abandon a project that we have invested a great deal in. Uh, and you can see that that could be partly in order to avoid cognitive dissonance. Um, it may also be an example of the, the waste not uh, rule in, in humans that uh, it has been somewhat overgeneralized. It is interesting that this particular kind of irrational behavior, the sunk costs fallacy, is more typical of adult humans than it is either of non-humans put into similar experimental paradigms or children. <laughs> so it seems to be uh, an adult human kind of tendency. Uh, the, one of the best known examples is Concord, begun in the 1960s. It was pretty clear from the outset that it would never pay its way, but they carried on pouring billions into it before uh, dropping it on safety grounds um, many years later, in fact, quite recently, after there was that bad accident in Paris. Uh, of course, one could argue that, uh, well, maybe it's not such a bad thing that uh, we put all that money into Concord. It, there was a tremendous amount of national pride involved. Uh, it was an Anglo-French project, so I suppose neither nation wanted to defect on the other. And a lot of people would say it was a design icon. It was a wonderful work of art, a beautiful aeroplane. It's just that it uh, was not economic uh, or ever likely to be. Now, money... Uh, it is an interesting thing in that uh, our perception of it can be very easily distorted. And way back in the 1940s, a couple of psychologists in America called Bruner and Goodman um, came up with a finding that poor children tended to see coins as being bigger than rich children. Uh, and they said that's because uh, the coin had more value to uh, a child that was poor. That particular study uh, has not been reliably replicated, um, but it did spark off a whole lot of other studies of perceptual uh, effects on coin sizes. Uh, my friend and colleague Adrian Furnham at University College London back in the 80s uh, discovered that people thought of the old pound notes as being bigger than the new ones that they had been replaced with. Uh, at the time, although it was not actually true. And uh, presumably what they had in their mind was that uh, inflation was running so fast that um, these new notes were actually worth less and therefore must be smaller was the kind of uh, mental calculation that was going on. Judgments of the size of the euro, which as you know is identical <laughs> around the whole of Europe, but uh, people's estimates of how big it is vary according to which country's coins they are rating. And uh, the particular study I'm citing here was a German study in which they found that Germans rated their euro as being uh, bigger than other people's, particularly uh, the, the sample included the Portuguese euro and uh, Portugal is a small country and was in some economic difficulty, so they rated their coins as being smaller, even though you know, everybody ought to realize uh, that, that the euro is the same size. But I think they, what they were required was without any reference point to give a measurement of its width in millimeters. Uh, and they, they weren't given two coins to rate which one's bigger. Uh, they were having to pull out of their head without without an anchor point, 
how big they thought that euro was. I don't know how the, um, the, the Cyprus euro would have done in <laughs> this particular study at the moment. Um, certainly, um, inflation frightens people. And uh, if inflation runs too fast, they have to re-denominate, that is, chop some zeros off the end of it. Now, I stayed at the Victoria Hotel, uh, Victoria Falls Hotel uh, in, um, in 1980s, I think it was, um, a little bit before the time of this American chap's bill here. This is not my bill, but um, dinner at the Victoria Falls Hotel in um, March 2008 cost over a billion dollars <laughs> Zimbabwe there. The mineral water was 95 million. <laughs> so uh, you, you can see why uh, from time to time countries with um, runaway inflation have to chop zeros off the end of, of the values of their currency. What is called the euro illusion is the perception that um, the changeover to the euros was feeding inflation. Now, of course, inflation was occurring to some degree, but there's no, actually no evidence that the changeover to the euro was responsible for that. But the perception that it was was largest in countries that had an extreme ex exchange rate. Um, if you take Italy, for example, uh, it would be a thousand odd lira to one euro. And uh, the Italians thought that inflation was being very cruel to them with the euro changeover. Whereas in the case of Ireland, it was almost a case of one euro to the punt. Uh, so uh, they didn't uh, believe that uh, inflation had damaged them greatly. But the ease with which the conversion can be made uh, also um, alters the apparent uh, inflation with the euro. In the case of Netherlands, apparently charity donations increased by 11% in 2004, shortly after they had changed over. And the reason seemed to be that one euro had come out as equal to 2.2 guilders in Dutch money. So that when people were reassessing what they should be giving to the charity, they simply used a two to one calculation to, to recalculate it uh, the old guilders into euros, and uh, the charities benefited enormously from that rule of thumb, two to one. Some similar effects, uh, when tourists are traveling in a country where uh, the local currency is a multiple of their own, for example, if you were traveling in Singapore, you would get about three Singapore dollars to the pound at last count, uh, and uh, you would tend to think that things were very expensive over there, so you would spend less than you otherwise would have. Whereas if the, uh, the changeover is a fraction, such that, um, like 0.33, uh, then you will tend to overspend. You'll think, oh, this is a cheap country, and uh, you'll be doing a lot of buying. Now money seems to operate almost like a drug in, in, in some respects. It ha it's a very peculiar commodity. People seem to never get enough of it. They will go on acquiring money that they don't need for any particular purpose. One possibility is that they are trying to use money as a source of prestige and a way of sort of keeping up with or ahead of the Joneses next door. Uh, but um, it, it's certainly true that we get attachment to money that goes beyond any sort of utilitarian value. People will sacrifice other areas of their lives their friends, their family, even their freedom to acquire more money than they can actually ever use. They seem to have a conditioned emotional attachment to money. They get attached to its particular form and uh, they, they don't like it being altered at all. They don't like uh, 
money being reprinted in a different form or uh, coming out in a different color with different metals or anything. It's, uh, people get very emotionally uneasy when the money that is familiar to them is changed in some way. And uh, it seems to provide a buzz that is, is craved in a similar way to an addiction and almost certainly involves the same dopamine reward circuits in, in the, uh, the base of the brain. Another study has shown that it will double as food if, if people's hunger is aroused by um, oh, pervading them with uh, delicious aromas of something, <laughs> some lovely food they tend to get fiscally tighter. They're less likely to contribute to a, a charity. Uh, as though the hunger is in some way parallel to or a substitute for, uh, for their finances. There are some experiments that seem to indicate that reminders of great wealth will make us um, parsimonious and generally less kind to other people and less interested in being with other people. Uh, the idea of money, which can be mobilized with a, a screensaver, the exper some experiments will use a money type screensaver here compared with um, goldfish or, or something as a neutral control condition. But if you've got those reminders of money in the background, you are more likely to increase your distance from the other people in the room. There's one, one of the findings, as though uh, the, the proximity of other people um, has become less attractive to you. And it's been suggested that there is a, an obvious um, evolutionary significance to this in that if you've ever observed an animal that makes a kill, it, it will uh, take it off somewhere quiet to eat it for fear that um, conspecifics will, will get a, a slice of the pie. Hoarding, of course, is also seen in the animal world. You have uh, plenty of animals, particularly rodents and birds, that will store food, but they do it for times of scarcity. And uh, it, while it has been suggested that that might be uh, an evolutionary basis for, for human hoarding, it's probably a little bit different because uh, animal hoarding is more like saving. It's putting it aside for uh, a rainy day. And people who put money aside because they have a particular purpose for it, they're saving to go on holiday or they're uh, trying to, to get their deposit on a, on a house, um, have a purpose in mind for it. Uh, what is a little bit different, true hoarding, I suppose, is compiling money just for its own sake without the intention of ever spending it. And that's much more like an obsessional compulsive disorder. Now, the psychoanalysts famously have related this to overly strict toilet training. Uh, but I have to say that uh, I have not come across any persuasive evidence that, that would support such an idea. There have been studies on attitudes to money in which um, the technique of factor analysis is used to sort people into um, different types uh, in, in accordance with the, the way they view money and the way they use money. And those have been related to personality traits. Power and prestige uh, is one sort of motive for acquiring money. And people who are obsessed by what money can do for them by way of power and prestige uh, seem to be the Machiavellian type of people. There is a questionnaire of Machiavellianism, which is tendency to manipulate others and use them for your own purposes. Uh, people who are concerned about security of their investments and uh, about the future 
tend to be people who are a little bit more anxious on personality questionnaires. Those who retain money, the hoarders, uh, of course, as we've suggested, tend to be obsessional types. My colleague Adrian Furnham again has done research on something called the work ethic. It used to be called the Protestant work ethic after a particular sociologist who first described it. Um, but uh, I don't think it's necessarily specific to being a Protestant. Uh, but uh, these are people who are obsessed with, with money. They tend to be more retentive of it. And uh, they have the belief that it can be gained by one's own efforts and abilities. Perhaps not surprisingly, low income goes with being frugal and being a bit anxious about your money. High income uh, relates to future planning and saving of money. The, the cause and effect relationships there are a little bit unclear, I have to say, but that's what the, the basic correlational finding was. The value of a monetary reward will diminish with the delay in its deliv delivery. In other words, if you've got to wait for it, uh, you value it less. That's called delay discounting. And uh, not surprisingly, poorer people will discount more. That is, they have a greater preference for the immediate reward uh, rather than saving or investing. Maybe they don't even have the choice. Um, the, the choice actually becomes uh, pretty clear if uh, on retirement for many people where they have the choice between a lump sum or payments, uh, smaller payments that go on for an indeterminate time down the line. Now, the, the lump sum is usually calculated to be less than you're actually likely to, to gain if you, uh, if you take the other option, which is smaller payments delayed down the line. Uh, so it is calculated to take account of that. Now, the interesting thing about delay discounting is that it's an excellent measure of impulsiveness as a personality trait. It goes with um, things like extroversion, smoking behavior. Here we have uh, the delay discount uh, decay function for non-smokers. Um, as against smokers, who quite clearly show uh, a plunge in, in the value of delayed money. Uh, and they're consistent with the idea that smokers tend to be impulsive people, which is why they get hooked on smoking or indeed alcohol or drug addiction. Uh, an interesting study has found that even the children of smoking mothers show higher delayed discounting than uh, non the children of non-smoking mothers, uh, suggesting perhaps a, a genetic link in the impulsiveness of the mother and, and the child. Compulsive shopping, shopaholism. It's, a, it's an impulse disorder uh, similar to OCD, uh, which can get you into considerable debt. Uh, it's disproportionately female uh, and uh, related to low self-esteem, depression, fear of appearing unattractive are some of the traits that go with it. Actually, some of my friends would claim that all their wives are, are shopaholics, I suppose, in the sense that they go shopping more than they would like. It's a bit of a stereotype. You might recall that interview when Ali G was visiting America. He did these incredibly politically incorrect interviews with famous people. On one occasion, he had uh, one of the great American feminists, Camille Paglier, I think her name was. And he said to her, um, do you think that there will ever be uh, a woman president of the United States? And she said, yes, of course, why not? And he said, well, aren't you afraid she'll spend all her time shopping for shoes? Oh. I've never seen a woman look so angry. <laughs> She had no idea that uh, Ali G was a spoof. Thought this, you know, this a, a young man conducting a genuine interview. Uh, but it is certainly true that um, shoes rank high amongst the targets 
of uh, compulsive buyers, second after clothing, shoes, jewelry, makeup. Uh, in the case of men, it's more likely to be CDs and records and electronics and car parts and so on. So there are some areas of shopaholism which affect uh, men more than women. Uh, it is felt as mood enhancing, that is when the compulsive shopper uh, scores down at the, uh, at the mall, they, they feel considerable relief. Um, and uh, it tends to peak in the, the pre-menstrual phase of the female cycle, the compulsive shopping expeditions. And treatments, uh, should they be agreed as necessary, um, cognitive behavior therapy and the antidepressants which elevate levels of serotonin seem to be uh, useful uh, treatment procedures. Now, there's no doubt that uh, the uh, compulsive shopping phenomenon, over shopping, is uh, encouraged by the availability of credit cards. And uh, in this particular e experiment, um, the researchers gave feedback to some subjects uh, who had completed a task. Some of them were told that they were uh, terrific, you know, went wonderful, you did better than 99% of people who have ever attempted these problems. The other group were given ego-threatening stuff, like you were rubbish, you know, you were, I think you were uh, the, the second percentile of all the people who have done this particular task. Something really damaging to, to their pride. Uh, they then um, gave them the options of, of buying designer jeans as against ordinary jeans and uh, the choice of whether to buy them using a credit card or, uh, or not, use cash. And uh, the findings were that uh, the experimental subjects with the damaged egos <laughs> were 30% more likely to go for expensive designer jeans than ordinary jeans, and uh, they were 60% more likely to use a credit card which might explain why uh, some consumers uh, in the, the lower socioeconomic uh, uh, status groups get themselves into terrible financial difficulty what with the ease of credit uh, as it has been and uh, payday loans even worse. Now, it's pretty clear that uh, in the early days, well, you know, going back historically a long way, uh, trade involved exchanges between real commodities like cattle and grain. Then they used precious metals like gold and silver as proxies for goods like cattle and grain. Then came coins and notes that uh, initially uh, the coins had real value. You know, it was a coin made out of silver and it the silver weighed so much and was uh, valuable to a certain degree. Uh, and um, of course, here in the city, people's gold would be kept in store by the goldsmiths, say. And uh, they would give you a note as to how much gold you had. Uh, you know, you could bring back the note and get your gold back any time, but it, at least it would save you carrying, lugging your gold around in sacks because, you know, it's quite heavy. But then they came up with a cunning idea of writing the notes to the bearer rather than to the individual so that they could then be passed on to other people so that anybody else could come and collect your gold if they were carrying the note that was written to the bearer of the note. So that system worked quite well for a while, and then they came up with a cunning plot, which is to print more notes uh, than they had gold in the reserves. So there were more <laughs> uh, bearer notes floating around, and of course we're well on our way to a fiat currency which has no real value in itself, it's just a bit of paper. And in fact that's the way it's gone, we've become progressively separated from uh, real commodities. And things like credit cards, cashless transactions, web payments, mobile phone trans transactions, 
uh, further and further removed from the real value of the cattle and grain. And uh, these researchers have uh, put up a case that this is one of the reasons that we have so much extravagance, so much uh, debt, so much inflation, is the disconnect between the forms of money that we use and the commodities that, uh, that they are underlying, that underlie them. Um, An obvious danger there. It may be one of the great drivers of inflation in the modern world and may be partly <laughs> responsible for the, the difficulties that we have found ourselves in recently. Now, kleptomania is a little bit like compulsive shopping, except that the kleptomaniac uh, doesn't uh, want to spend any money on these goods. They just want to, st want to steal them. Uh, but in many other respects, it's similar. They have repetitive thoughts about stealing, and uh, they get feelings of relief when they have stolen some goods. Uh, they may um, feel a little bit of guilt or remorse, but sometime later, not, not at the, the moment that they're actually putting something into their handbag. The things that they steal may not be needed at all. They're not necessarily taken for monetary gain. Uh, Winona Ryder, of course, is a famous uh, Hollywood film star who was caught shoplifting, and she certainly didn't need the money, but she just seemed to have a compulsion to steal. It, again, goes with uh, obsessional compulsive disorders, mood disorders generally, anxiety. Sensation-seeking is a trait that uh, is found in some kleptomaniacs. Uh, otherwise, it goes with eating disorders and substance abuse and is about three times as common in women uh, as men. In fact, it's one of the few shoplifting, is one of the few crimes uh, in which uh, women engage in more than men. Um, although some people have argued that uh, it only looks that way because when men steal something from a shop, they tend to go to jail rather than to a clinic for any kind of treatment. But it's, again, similar to compulsive shopping in that it seems to vary with the female cycle. Uh, the same treatments, SSRIs, uh, CBT, and anti-opioids, um, which diminish your capacity to get pleasure from those reward circuits, uh, seem to be also helpful, uh, a promising line of treatment. Now, here's an important uh, principle within behavioral economics, that um, we are more hurt by losses than we are pleased by our gains. And uh, there aren't too many psychologists that get Nobel Prizes, but this chap, Daniel Kahneman, uh, got one for uh, prospect theory, as it was called, but loss aversion was a central idea within his theory. Um, Daniel Kahneman is a, a psychologist, but you the main reason you don't get too many uh, Nobel Prizes go to psychologists is there is no Nobel Prize in psychology, so Kahneman had to get it in economics. Uh, and his mate might have got it as well, except that he died inconveniently, and uh, you, don't, you don't get posthumous uh, Nobel Prizes either. And uh, the, the principle of loss aversion seems to account for quite a lot of phenomena within um, behavioral economics. And uh, the idea is that selling is felt as a loss. Something is goods are going away from you. And that results in a buy-sell price discrepancy, which I'm going to discuss again a little bit later. And a typical sort of study that has been done in connection with this is that uh, bonuses which are given up front, and then you're told that if you don't do well, we'll draw some of it back, are uh, more effective uh, in motivating performance than those which are increased for good performance. The way in which a 
message is framed may be critical to the decision that you will make uh, in relation to it. If the message draws attention to potential losses, it tends to be more persuasive than those which offer gains. Uh, I'll give you an example which might make sense. If you were to have an operation and uh, you're told that this um, operation has a 90% survival, you'll be reasonably happy about that. But if you're told that it has a 10% mortality, <laughs> it means the same thing, but it will frighten the hell out of you. And you, you, might, uh, you might not undergo it. And that's what's been going on with some of the experiments that uh, the behavioral economics people have been doing. Uh, take this one, for example. Uh, an experiment in which the trial starts, you're given 50 pounds up front. And uh, here's your choice. You're told that you can either keep 20 pounds for sure or gamble all or nothing with these probabilities of, uh, of losing or winning. In that uh, paradigm, uh, the, the gain scenario, 43% uh, chose to gamble. Here we have exactly the same situation, but it's framed differently. You got the 50 quid and you're told that you can either lose 30 pounds or you can gamble all or nothing on it. When it was framed as a potential loss, 62% would go for the gamble. In other words, the loss of 30 pounds is more painful than the pleasure of keeping the 20. <laughs> if that makes sense to you. Uh, these researchers at the same time were also monitoring uh, magnetic uh, resonance imaging in the brain and showing that an area of the brain in, called the amygdala was more activated in this loss frame situation than in the gain frame. Uh, and the amygdala is famously associated with fear. So people are fearing to lose something. Here's a nice experiment on the effect of framing uh, on consumer behavior. And this is a real life study in which uh, an Israeli bank, I think it was, uh, identified a number of customers who had credit cards but weren't using them. And to half of them, they sent uh, the message, uh, a letter, uh, explaining how beneficial it would be to use your credit card. Uh, the other people were given a letter explaining what they were probably missing out on by not using their credit card. And they found that twice as many people who had um, been given the, the message about the potential loss started to use their credit card. So it seems that threatening people with what they might lose is a more effective motivator than offering them a potential gain. Closely related is the phenomenon of mental accounting. Uh, associated with this chap Thala. Uh, he says that people place their transactions into parcels that will limit their rationality. Take this situation. You've paid £10 for a theatre ticket, but you lose it on your way to the theatre. Would you buy another ticket on arrival so that you can see the show? Now, apparently 46%, less than half, would buy a second uh, ticket. But... Um, if you arrive at the theatre intending to buy a theatre ticket at the door and discover that you've lost £10 on the way uh, and you're asked would you still pay the £10 to see the show, then 88%, nearly everybody, says yes, of course they would. Now why? Because the two situations are economically equivalent. I, either way, you're down £20. Um, the difference seems to be that if you buy a second ticket, when you already had one, it makes the show seem very expensive, too expensive. Uh, but um, losing the cash is not posted against the same account. It's not seen to be relevant. And uh, it seems that a lot of decisions we make are illogical because of this sort of artificial bracketing that, that goes on. 
The endowment effect is a tendency to overvalue the things we own against equivalent things that we don't own. And uh, they have discovered experimentally that people would want more money to part with belongings that they have than it would take to buy them. And of course that's a deterrent to trade and it drives inflation. Uh, homeowners typically overvalue their own property by about 12%. Uh, car owners tend to get insulted by the trade-in offers that they get. <laughs> and, and therefore refuse to sell. So you can see how this uh, makes it difficult to negotiate prices on things like houses and cars. Now it could be down to loss aversion, or so other people have argued that it's actually a discount for the trading costs and risks. There's a chance that uh, the other guy might defect on the deal, and uh, that risk has to be taken into account as part and becomes part of the endowment effect. Now, since it, uh, the endowment effect is greater if you've owned the goods for a long time, then we suspect that sentimental value also comes into it. If you've had something for a long time, you become attached to it, and it's very hard to let go. And the endowment effect has been demonstrated uh, to occur in an area of the brain called the insula, which is part of the cortex, uh, very closely allied with the amygdala. Um, it is um, an area where you actually experience emotions rather than have your emotions generated. And uh, the area has been associated with feelings of pain, disgust, and anticipation of monetary loss, would you believe? So the endowment effect has been observed in the brain. And the final topic that I thought I would look at is the question of the connection between money and happiness. Uh, you know, it, it might seem obvious that the more money you've got, the happier you are. And it's true, apparently, up to a point. Up to about 50, oops, sorry. Up to about 50,000 pounds, you get happier. Beyond that, there are diminishing returns and you don't get very much happier. Nations that are wealthy tend to be happier than poor ones. These are the OECD nations. No, Africa is not in this at all. The really poor nations are not here. These are advanced nations. But you can see that uh, the GDP correlates pretty well with, uh, with happiness. But there are some exceptions. New Zealand, for example, is a country that apparently doesn't have a, an exceptional average GDP, but is uh, a place where people are content along with Sweden and Australia and Canada. Uh, Norway has apparently got the highest GDP per head of population. Yeah, sorry about the whistling, I don't know how to prevent that. Uh, in Western countries, of course, our income has been soaring over the years. You might not feel like that, but it is true, but, and happiness has, if anything, been going the other way. Uh, somebody else has shown that the connection between money and happiness is stronger for people who are on hourly rates than people on salaries. Presumably the difference is that if you're on a salary, uh, there are usually sources of career satisfaction that can explain to you why you are doing this job, uh, even though you're being paid a pittance. The uh, interesting thing about wealth is that it can interfere with people's ability to enjoy the simple things in life. The raindrops on roses and the, the rest of the Julie Andrews song. Uh, wealthy people and lottery winners, there were a couple of lottery winners moaning in the paper this morning that it was a poisoned chalice that ruined their life. Uh, what they report is a loss of savoring ability is the way it's described. It undermines the um, positive effect of wealth on their happiness. They lose the capacity to enjoy the, uh, the simple pleasures. And presumably, it's because after experiencing the best of everything, the little pleasures cease to be exciting. So there is a downside to being very rich. You'll be delighted to hear. <laughs> uh, 
In this particular experiment, I don't know how you pronounce that, coid bark maybe, um, the experimental participants were exposed to reminders of great wealth, again using the sort of the screensaver idea, pictures of money. Uh, they, they weren't told of the relevance of that, it was just background stuff. But they were observed to spend less time savoring a piece of chocolate that they'd been given, incidentally, in, in the course of the experiment. And um, they were filmed eating this bit of chocolate, and independent observers had to rate how much uh, pleasure they were gaining from this little bit of chocolate. And the more there were reminders of wealth in the background, the less they savoured the chocolate. Now, where behavior is motivated by things like love or social responsibility, an offer of payment is going to be insulting. Your partner's just cooked you a delicious meal of your favorite foods. Uh, you don't pull out your checkbook and say, oh, how much is that going to cost? Or if a stra stranger has fished you out of a pond from drowning, uh, once again, you don't say, how much do I owe you? Uh, it would be seriously rude to do that. Uh, the presumption is that these people were motivated by the goodness of, the, of their heart. Uh, other studies within the field of cognitive dissonance have shown that if people are paid a derisory sum for their efforts, they enjoy the task less than if they were paid a lot of money, obviously, or if they did it for nothing at all. They would rather do it for nothing than to be paid an insulting amount of money. And uh, this undermining effect, as it's been called, has been observed uh, when incentive payments are applied to people. It's been observed as a reduction in the brain reward circuits. So sometimes it can be less rewarding to be paid for something than not. And uh, this is the, the final point, is that uh, if you want your money to make you happy, the best thing is to give it to somebody else. Uh, the most reliable way to happiness is uh, charity um, or philanthropy, perhaps. Again, the warm glow that is experienced in making voluntary contributions compared to having it removed from you as a kind of taxation has been observed in brain dopamine experiments. And a number of people, of course, have been feigned for giving away a lot of their money in recognition of the fact that hanging on to it, hoarding it, is not uh, going to be a source of satisfaction to them, that misers are indeed miserable. There may, of course, be a, a few exceptions. Uh, the um, comedian Jackie Mason, American comedian, said... Um, Money is not the most important thing in life. Love is. Fortunately, I love money. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ron. <for that. laughs>